In this video, I'm going to attempt to give you some idea of how we count infinite sets in mathematics. And when we talk about the set of natural numbers, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, the, you could call, call them the counting numbers, I want to give you first of all an idea of how far this goes. Because I, th I think a lot of people, once they think they're getting up to a million, they're getting uh, pretty close to infinity. In other words, it's just over the hill from a million. But in mathematics, we, we can create numbers that keep going and going and going. Um, for example, there's a number in math called the Google, that's spelt with an O-L, and that's 10 to the 100. And to give you a, just a slight appreciation of how big that number is, I, I looked up on the internet, I, I looked for the number of grains of sand on the planet Earth. And I don't know how someone managed to work this out, but they had come up with a figure like this, 7.5 times 10 to the 18th. So if you thought of taking all the grains of sand on the planet Earth and lining them up in a row, and uh, putting a tag on each one of them, sand number one, number two, number three, number four, and if you just imagine how far that line of sand would go, that would be 10 to the 18th. And to get to 10 to the 19th, you'd have 10 of those lines of sand. So, to get to 10 to the 100, which is what we call a Google, is a long, long way even from there. And we also have another number in, uh, in mathematics called a Googleplex which is actually 10 raised to the Google. And if you think Google is a long way away, then 10 to the Google is just incredible. I, I can't even imagine how far away that is. So I'm doing that just to give you an idea of how far these numbers go. It's, it's, it's hard for our minds to even conceive of, of going that far. And I'm going to refer to uh, uh, George Cantor, he's, he's often considered the, uh, the founder of set theory, this, these curly brackets that you find in mathematics in defining sets. Um, George did a lot of the work uh, initially uh, in what we call set theory. Now, before we start counting infinite sets, I want to give you a very basic idea of how we could compare finite sets. And if you want to compare the number of elements in this set with the number in there, and you don't want to talk about this number being bigger than that number just by looking at the two sets, we set up what's called a one-to-one -one correspondence. So we match the A with the M, B with the N, C with the O, and so on. And if you run out of letters here before you run out of them down there, then you say, of course, there are more letters in the second set. And this is the method we use in mathematics for comparing infinite sets. If we can set up a one-to-one -one correspondence between two sets, then we say there are the same number in both sets, or the same order of infinity, if you don't like using the word number. So, for example, here's a set with our counting numbers. And remember how far that goes. It's a long way out. And here's a set of what we call integers, the counting numbers along with zero and their, their negatives. And if I just said to you, well, which set has more numbers, you'd probably say this one has twice as many in it because it's got all of these positives and their negatives. But it's possible to set up a one-to-one -one correspondence between this set and that one. Now you can't just start here and go out to the end because there is no end out there. So what you do is you go 0, 1, minus 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3, and so on. And we set up a correspondence 1 to 1 with the natural numbers. And since we don't run out of numbers in either one of those. We, we can't say that there are more in one of these sets than the other. We refer to this second set as being a countable infinity. 
It's the same order of infinity as the natural numbers. And we give it this symbol, aleph naught or aleph zero, to describe any set which is what we call in mathematics a countable set. One where we can take the elements of the set and count them and leave no gaps. Don't leave anybody out. Somewhere we're going to get to any number in this set that, that we want to get to and assign it a counting number. Now, let's look at the number line. We've talked about all the natural numbers, zero, and the, and the negatives, which are the, 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 comprise the integers. What else do we have on this number line? Well, we've got fractions, which are referred to as rational numbers. Now, what do we know about fractions? Fractions are decimals that either terminate or they repeat. Every fraction either terminates or the decimals here repeat. So one of the uh, projects that George Cantor looked at was are the fractions countable? And this is what he did. This row contains all the fractions with the numerator 1. And remember it goes all the way up to infinity and beyond. These are all the fractions with a 2 for the numerator. 3, 4, 5. So in other words, we have an infinite set of infinite fractions. But if you count them this way, and this was the, the diagonal method that he sort of pioneered. This is number 1, this is number 2, this is number 3, number 4. Leave that one out because we've already got it. That's a 1. That's the next one, the next one, and so on. And we have set up a one-to-one -one correspondence between the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on, and the fractions. So George's argument was that the fractions, or rational numbers, are countable because we can literally set up a one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. So, is there anything else on the number line? Well, we've got the fractions, which we call rational numbers. We also have irrational numbers. These are those, those weird numbers that don't terminate and they don't repeat. Uh, numbers like pi, root 2, root 3, all those awkward roots. Um, they're, they're irrational, but they're not, not necessarily unpredictable. You can make up an irrational number. Here, 2, 3, 2, 2, 3, 2, 2, 2, 3. Notice I'm putting an extra 2 in every time. It's predictable, but it doesn't repeat. So when we talk about irrational numbers, we're talking about numbers that don't quit, they don't terminate, and they don't repeat. So George said, okay, the fractions are countable, the rationals are countable, what about the irrationals? Well, to tackle that problem, he, he went at it in reverse and he said, what if we assume that there is a method for listing irrational numbers? So somebody has this, this method of taking every possible irrational number there is and making a list like we did with the fractions. And I'm just going to take the, uh, the decimals that are be between 0 and 1. Now what his argument was that suppose someone had a countable list. It went on to infinity but it was countable in that we had an order to it. We could say this is the first, this is the second, this is the third, fourth, and so on. He argued that he could then create a number that's not in the list. And what he said was, well, let's go down again on a, he liked diagonal methods. He said, let's go down here, let's change that number, that number, that number, that number. Let's create a number that's not in the list. Therefore proving 
that the irrationals are not countable. Now I've seen some mathematicians uh, have, have some disagreements with this, but uh, according to the, the set theory that uh, Cantor developed, his conclusion was that the rational numbers are a countable infinity, represented by elf naught, but the irrational ones were not countable, and they were therefore a higher order of infinity. Now, I said, as I said at the start, this is just a beginner's guide to how we count in mathematics. There's all kinds of information out there on the internet. Uh, even if you just look up Aleph Knot, um, it, it can give you a, a little more idea of how we deal with infinities in mathematics.